Welcome to lecture 6.7, Ruler and Compass Constructions. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato, who lived in the 5th century BC, believed that the only perfect geometric figures were the straight line and the circle. He used this to motivate his idea of perfect forms, which we now know as Platonic forms. He said that everybody knows what a perfectly straight line looks like, or a perfect circle looks like, but nobody's ever seen one. At least that was true back in the day. Now with modern technology, I think a lot of people have seen perfectly straight lines or perfect circles. In ancient Greek geometry, this philosophy meant that there were only two instruments available to perform geometric constructions. There is the ruler, which is a single unmarked straight edge, and there is a compass, and the compass collapses when lifted from the page. So it's not like the compasses that you may have used in elementary school where you can pick it up and then use that to measure distances elsewhere. Formally, having only a ruler and compass on hand means that the only permissible constructions by the ancient Greeks are those granted by Euclid's first three postulates. Euclid was an ancient Greek mathematician, and around the year 300 BC, he wrote a series of 13 books that he called The Elements. This is a collection of definitions, postulates, what we now know as axioms, and theorems and proofs covering geometry, elementary number theory, and the Greeks' so-called geometric algebra. Book 1 contained Euclid's famous ten postulates and other basic propositions of geometry. Here are Euclid's first three postulates, which are the only permissible constructions granted by having a ruler and a compass. The first one says that a straight line segment can be drawn joining any two points, of course using a ruler. The second postulate says any straight line segment can be extended indefinitely in a straight line. That's also using a ruler. And the third postulate says, given any straight line segment, a circle can be drawn having the segment as radius and one endpoint as center. Of course, that is using a compass. Using only these tools, the ancient Greeks discovered that lines can be divided into equal segments Angles can be bisected, parallel lines can be drawn, n-gons can be squared, and so on. A lot of other basic geometric constructions can be done. One of the chief purposes of ancient Greek mathematics was to find exact constructions for various lengths using only the basic tools of a ruler and a compass. Problem 1 squaring the circle. This says, draw a square with the same area as a given circle. Problem two, doubling the cube. This has one, draw a cube with twice the volume of a given cube. And problem three, trisecting an angle. Divide an angle into three smaller angles all of the same size. For over 2,000 years, these problems remained unsolved. Alas, in 1837, Pierre Wansel used field theory to prove that these constructions were impossible. In the remainder of this lecture, we will re-examine these problems in more detail and try to understand what it means for a length or an angle to be constructible. It turns out that there is a field of constructible numbers, which is an extension field of the rationals. And the length or angle is constructible if and only if it lies in that extension field. In the next lecture, we will revisit these three problems again and phrase them in terms of what length or angle has to be constructible. And in each case, we will prove that that number is not in the field of constructible numbers. I hope you're as impressed with this as I am, because I think it's just remarkable that this very basic problem 
that stumped the ancient Greeks and stumped mankind for over 2,000 years has a very simple solution in terms of field theory. First, we need to ask what it means to be constructible. Let's start by assuming that P0 is a set of points in R2. Or equivalently, you can think of it as a set of points in the complex plane. Here's a formal definition. The points of intersection of any two distinct lines or circles are constructible in one step. Next, we can iterate this process. We say that a point R in the plane is constructible from our original set P0, it could be finite or infinite, if there is a finite sequence of points, R1, R2, all the way up to Rn, which is going to be R, such that for each point, so for each I, the point Ri is constructible in one step from P0 and all of the previous points. So let me just sketch what this might look like. Very rough sketch here. So here, here are some points in the plane. So I suppose this is P0. Then we can always draw lines between any two points. I'm not going to draw every possible line, but I'll just draw some of them. Something like this. We can always draw circles if, for each segment. So we can draw this circle. We can draw this circle. We can draw, there's a lot of other circles we can draw. Let's, let's draw this one. And so forth. So again, pardon sloppiness here. But what this definition says is the point of intersections from any two distinct lines or circles are constructible in one step. So that means that all of these intersection points here, this, this, all these ones that I'm drawing in red, these are all constructible in one set from my original points. So let's say P0 were these X's. All of these intersections and more, because there's a lot more circles and lines that I could draw, those are the points constructible in one step. Next, let's take our original points P0 and throw in all of these red points. And then draw all possible lines and circles that you can do. And take all of those intersections. Those are the points that are constructible in two steps. And so on. So a point is constructible from P0 if it's constructible in a finite number of steps according to this process. Let's do some basic examples of constructions that the ancient Greeks did. First, bisecting a line. We start with a line, let's say P1, P2, which we wish to bisect. Draw the circle of center P1 and of radius P1, P2, that line segment. Next, draw the circle of center P2 of radius P1, P2. Let's let R1 and R2 be the points of intersection of these two circles. And let's draw the line between R1 and R2. And that bisects the original segment. So let's let R3 be the intersection of both segments P1, P2 and R1, R2. Now let's see how to bisect an angle. So let's start with an angle at a point A. Let's draw a circle centered at A. I won't draw the whole thing, just part of it. Next, let's let B and C be the points of the intersection. Fourth step, draw a circle of radius BC centered at B. Next, draw a circle of radius BC centered at C. Let D and E be the intersections of these two circles. And finally, draw a line through this DE, which is going to bisect the angle A. Let's now try to interpret this more formally. So let's suppose that A is at the origin in the complex plane. Then B is equal to R, that is the real number R. And C, as a complex number, is R e to the i theta, where theta is the angle at A. Bisecting an angle 
formally means that we can construct the complex number r e to the i theta over 2, which is right here, from a complex number r e to the i theta, which is this point c. Now we need to formalize what it means for a real or a complex number to be constructible. Henceforth, we will say that a point, again in R2 or in the complex plane, is constructible if it is constructible from this set of two points, 0, 0, and 1, 0 in R2. We will also say that a complex number, z, or x plus yi, is constructible if the point x, y is constructible in R2, again, from the set of points. Let's let k be the subset of complex numbers that are constructible. Now, it's not clear a priori that this is a field, but this is something that we will show. Here's a simple lemma that we will state without proof. It says a complex number z, let's call it x plus yi, is constructible if x and y are constructible. So a picture of what this looks like is, here's the complex plane. Let's say that x is on the, here's, here's the real axis, and here's the imaginary axis. So let's say that yi is up here, and this is the point 1, or 1, 0, thought of it in R2. And this says that if we can construct x over here and y i over here, then we can construct x plus y i up there. By this and the following lemma, we can restrict our focus on real constructible numbers, and that just makes things easier. So I'm showing you this because these lemmas are a sketch of the proof that the set of constructible numbers is a subfield of the complex numbers. In other words, it's an extension field of the rational numbers. So this lemma, again, we don't yet know that. We are trying to prove that the constructible numbers are a field. says that this set, this is k intersect r, this is just the constructible numbers that are real. That is a subfield of the real numbers, if and only if the constructible numbers is a subfield of the complex numbers. So that's one thing that we can prove. This second part says that the set of constructible real numbers is closed under non-negative square roots if and only if k is closed under all square roots. Now what do I mean by closed under square roots? Well, the real constructible numbers are closed under square roots means that if we have a real constructible number a, then the square root of a is also constructible. Similarly, the set k of complex constructible numbers being closed under square roots means the following. If we have a complex number r e to the i theta, which is constructible, then the following complex number, square root of r times e to the i theta over 2, also has to be constructible. Now, complex numbers will have more than one square root. For example, the square root of 2 could be root 2 or negative root 2, and this is just saying that this particular one, which is probably the first one that you would think of, also has to be constructible. These lemmas are enough to prove the following theorem, which says that the set of constructible numbers k is a subfield of c, the complex numbers, or equivalently, an extension field of the rationals that is closed under taking square roots and closed under complex conjugation. Let me sketch a picture of what this looks like. So here's the complex plane. Let's suppose that we have a complex number. Let me call it z, which is a plus bi. So a, of course, is the real part and bi is the complex part, or the imaginary part, I should say. Now in polar coordinates, we can write this as r e to the i 
theta, where theta is this angle here, and r is this length, which is, by the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared. So if we have this constructible complex number, then the following two complex numbers are also constructible. First, there's the square root of z. And so as we said in the previous slide, that is the complex number. Let's draw it right here. So this is root z. Now it's just easier to draw or to write in polar coordinates. So its, its length is the square root of r. So this and its angle is pi, or not pi, i theta over 2. So it's got half the angle, half the angle and square root of the length. And next, the complex conjugate, of course, is this number. Let me draw this one in red. This complex number down here, z bar, which is a minus b i, which is r e to the negative i theta, because this angle is now negative theta. So that's what this theorem says. Here's a sketch of the proof. Suppose a and b are constructible real numbers where a is positive. It is elementary to check that each of the following holds. Negative a is constructible. a plus b is constructible. A times B is constructible. A inverse, or 1 over A, is constructible. And once you have those four intermediate results, then it's elementary to show that root A is constructible and that A minus BI is constructible, provided that A plus BI is as well. An important corollary of this is that if A, B, and C are constructible complex numbers, then so are the roots of the polynomial ax squared plus bx plus c. And this is because by the quadratic equation, the roots of this polynomial can be expressed very simply using just these six operations established in the proof of this theorem. Now, let's construct constructible numbers as certain field extensions. So let's suppose that f is a field generated by ruler and compass constructions. Let's suppose that alpha is constructible from f in one step. So it's not in f, but we can construct it. We wish to determine the degree of the extension field f adjoined alpha over f. Well, there are three ways to construct new points from f. The first is to intersect two lines then the point of intersection is the solution to a set of linear equations. Let's say ax plus by equals c and dx plus ey equals f. Now this is something we can solve using basic algebra or basic arithmetic so the solution lies in the original field f. So in that case the degree of this extension is just 1 because this f adjoint alpha is equal to f. The second way to construct a new point from f is to intersect a circle and a line. This corresponds to solving the following system of equations. The first being a line, ax plus by equals c. And the second being a circle, x minus d quantity squared plus y minus e quantity squared equals r squared. So you can solve this using basic arithmetic, possibly taking square roots. And the solution lies in, at most, a quadratic extension of f. Because it's just going to be a simple formula involving arithmetic and possibly a square root. So in this case, f adjoined our new point, this degree, is either going to be 1 or 2. The third way to construct a new point is to intersect two circles. In this case, we need to solve the following system of equations, just two generic equations for circles. And now, without writing it out in detail, imagine what happens if you multiply both of these equations out and then you subtract them. Well, the x squared terms 
and the y squared terms will cancel and what you get is the equation of a line. So you're just going to have x's, y's, and a bunch of constants. Intersecting this line with one of the circles, doesn't matter which one, puts us back in case 2. And so the new point lies in at most a quadratic extension of f. In all of these cases, the degree of the field extension f adjoin alpha over f is at most 2. In other words, constructing a number alpha which is not in your field in one step amounts to taking a degree 2 extension of f. Therefore, we get the following theorem, which says that a complex number alpha is constructible. Recall that means from the two points, 0, 0, and 1, 0, in a finite number of steps, if and only if there is a tower of field extensions beginning with the rational numbers, let's call that k0. So k1 is an extension of k0, k2 is an extension of k1, all the way up to kn, an extension field that contains alpha. And the requirement is that each field extension has to have degree at most 2 over the previous one. And of course, we could require this being equal to 2 because we could just ignore all the times that we are doing things like intersecting lines, which doesn't actually give you an extension because the intersection is in the original field. So recall why q has to be here, because if we start with 0, 0, and 1, 0, then we can construct all of the integers. And then because we can construct fractions, we can construct all of the rational numbers. So just ha starting with two points guarantees the in sorry, guarantees the rational numbers, and then we can go from there. An immediate corollary of this is that if alpha is a constructible complex number, then the degree of the field extension q adjoint alpha over q has to be some power of 2. In the next lecture, we will show that the ancient Greeks classical construction problems that they could not solve are indeed impossible by demonstrating that each would yield a real number alpha such that the degree of the extension of q adjoin alpha over q is not a power of 2. So that's the game plan. Stay with us.